Matthew chapter 27, please. Matthew chapter 27. The keepers will shake again. The keepers will shake again. Father, I thank you, God, for putting this message on my heart. I thank you, Lord, for giving me the strength to deliver it. I thank you for clarity of thought. I thank you, Lord, for the anointing that lifts and gives not only the ability to speak, but gives us each the ability to hear. Let something, Lord, of this word go very deep into our hearts. Let faith be stirred in us. God, you are speaking to us. You you yourself said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is speaking. So give us hearing ears today. Lord, we thank you for it. God, give me the ability to speak this. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 62. Now the next day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He's risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch, go your way and make it sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure. That means the grave, the gravestone, sealing the stone and setting a watch. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly, tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead, and behold, he goes before you into Galilee, and there you shall see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. Now, folks, there has been and continues to be today an ongoing battle. It's a spiritual battle. The powers of darkness having gotten a hold of men's hearts, attempting to declare that God's testimony on the earth is dead. And the enemy has always attempted to create a barrier whereby those who are searching cannot lay hold or cannot see him or find Jesus Christ again. Now, often this has been done through government authorities where these self-appointed guardians of godlessness, as I call them, seek to create new rules and new laws that bar people's legitimate access to the presence of God. Scripture says, so they went, in verse 66, and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Now these are, these are what I would call evil religionists. They have an incomplete and a darkened view of God. They lust for the praise of men, political power, and such like. They're of one spirit with those who live outside of the kingdom of God. And you can see these men going to Pilate and asking him, said, give us the power to seal up this stone because we don't want anybody encountering Jesus anymore. The first error, of course, they felt was that they had let people walk with him and listen to him for too long. That's why they said the last year will be worse than the first. The first one is, I believe from the way I see it, is they felt in their hearts that they should have killed him sooner. They shouldn't have let him go on for as long as he did. And now they were concerned that people were going to have an encounter with Christ even though they considered him to be dead. And they knew there was a grave danger to their own kingdom if this should happen. In Psalm chapter 2, second Psalm, it says these words, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Why do people so rage against Christ? Why is there such an anger? Why do the atheists in New York City feel that they have to put a crucified Christ, 
up on a large billboard in Times Square and declare the Son of God to be a myth. Why the rage inside of these people? It seems ironic to me they spend so much money and time trying to convince people that something they don't believe exists doesn't exist. If you, if you can't see the irony in that, my gut feeling is they have grave mis reservations in their own heart about what they're fighting against. But the essence of the rage of humankind against God is found in a sin nature. You remember that when Satan came down into the garden, he tempted Adam and Eve with a theological, it was a theological fruit they partook of. That if you will agree with me, and if you will bite into what I'm saying to you, essentially speaking, that you will be as God. Your eyes will be open, and you will know what is good and what is evil. You will chart your own course, determine your own destiny, create your own rules, and somehow still arrive at a utopian end when it's all over. In effect, the sin nature of man tells man that he can be his own God. And this is the reason why humankind has always raged against the true God and the living God, because if there is a true God, if there is a living God, if, if, if he is the one who does speak things into existence, if he does create borders of behavior and such like, then essentially speaking, then men are not God. And so there has to be this rage. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Why do they vainly think that they can contain the testimony of God and destroy his influence in society? In order to do this, in verses 2 and 3 of Psalm 2, it says, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. In other words, let's break the restrictions that their belief in God has imposed on our society and upon our lawless behavior. Let's minimize and impede the testimony and influence of those who walk with God. And folks, we are living at a moment like that in history again. We are living at an exact moment, very, very similar to what is described in the scriptures. The godless will always attempt to contain the present generation while completely eradicating the strength and the testimony of the next generation. Listen in Exodus chapter 1. It says, There arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we are. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it comes to pass when there falls, falls out any war, they join our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities. The godless will always attempt to deal with wisely with the people of God, lest we discover our strength and escape their control. And that's what happened in the days of Pharaoh. He said, these people don't know it, but they are more than we are, and they are mightier than we are. Unless they should discover who they really are, let's afflict them. Let's create rules over them. Let's keep them weary. Let's keep them fighting on a wrong front. Let's keep them feeling that theirs is a hopeless situation from which there is no relief and no escape. And while they are down, while they are burdened, let's take all of their sons and cast them into the river. Let's take their children. You know, the Bible tells us that there's a, a, a stream of crystal clear water that proceeds from the throne of God. That, that represents healing and truth and a right way of thinking and doing things. But there's also a polluted stream in this world, a confused stream. And Pharaoh is essentially saying, while we've got the people of God while we've got them feeling that they are weaker than they really are, let's take their children and let's cast them into this place of confused humanistic thinking. Let's take away their single-mindedness for the things of God. Let's, let's take away the next generation. And if we get the next generation, we have got the testimony of God in our grasp. But thank God, the psalmist in Psalm 2 says this, this is a vain imagining. You cannot contain God. You cannot put God in a box. You cannot keep him in a tomb. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And how foolish to think that we can. Heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. 
The scripture says he sits in heavens and he will laugh at all these attempts to eradicate the testimony of who he is from society. And God help those who set out to do this for their end will always be the same as the end of those who have tried in times past. In the Egyptian mind, they must have thought we've conquered them and they will forever serve us. We've got them. They're on the run. We're on the rise. How many times do you see that through scripture with the Midianites and Gideon, with the Philistines and the armies that uh, were fighting against Saul? How many times do we see this same scenario play itself out over and over and over again? But what all of these people throughout history have not banked on is the fact that God hears the prayers of his people, especially when their prayer becomes a cry. And I've been looking at the prayers on the website from the last two weeks, and there is a cry in the hearts of people. I don't know if you've noticed it or not on Tuesday nights, but people are putting their whole situation up there. They're putting their name on it, where they live, and they don't care. That's what a cry is. There's no pretense in it anymore. I'm in jail, one of them. I'm a child molester. I've been told that there's no hope for me. Is there any hope? Can somebody pray for me? I'm a grandfather. I've been addicted to drugs all my life. I've ruined my relationship with my children. Now I'm ruining the relationship with my grandchildren. Would you pray that I can get set free from all of these things that have been in my heart? Folks, I thank God that I hear something. The prayer of this generation is becoming a cry one more time. Thank God. Psalm 107 tells us that God hears when his people begin to cry. When the prayer goes deeper than just fancy words and King James English and attendance at a meeting, when God's people finally come in and say, oh God, you've got to do something. You've got to help me. I don't care who knows. I don't care if my name is broadcast over the whole world. I wanna be free. I wanna walk with you, God. I want your healing to be in my family. I want your freedom to be in my mind. God Almighty, I'm tired. People put their prayer requests on the website with their name saying, I'm hooked on pornography. I'm a Christian. I go to church. I'm so tired of the bondage. One of them from Florida was a heartbreak. I said, please pray for us. Pray for all of us who are Christians and we're so hooked on pornography and we don't know how to get out of it. Oh God, this is a prayer that God is going to answer. There's no pride in it. There's no pretense in it. It's come now down to the wire. We're saying, God, if you don't do something, nothing is going to happen. If you don't raise us up, we're never going to be free. Oh, hallelujah. Psalm 107 talks about when the lonely, when the confused, when the hungry, when the thirsty, when those who have rebelled against God's words that have been clearly revealed to them, when the afflicted, when the spiritually ignorant, when those who thought money would bring them happiness, when everything starts to fail around them, it says, then they cry and God hears them. God delivers them. He opens their eyes to wonderful truth. He breaks their chains, opens their prison doors, calms their storm, makes their hearts glad, brings them into true blessing in life, gives them an endless supply, brings them into a new family and uses them to close the mouths of those who have been boasting that there is no God. That's what God does. That's what God always does in every generation. Thank God, thank God, thank God. In Exodus chapter three, verses seven to 10, it says, the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters for I know their sorrows. And I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I've also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee to Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God doesn't deliver his people when we are proud and strong in ourselves, but when we begin to realize that without him we have no strength, when we finally humbled ourselves, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, have that desire to turn from what the scripture clearly says is wicked. 
then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. Now I know that's a promise to the nation of Israel, but that is a promise that you and I can bank on today for the nature of God is still the same. His character doesn't change. He is who he is. And what he says he will do, he will do. Irrespective of as a promise for another season, you and I can still lay hold of that promise. And I thank God for it with all my heart. I thank God for those moments in my own life where I've lost strength. For in those moments, I can say like the apostle Paul, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I've given up, when I have not had the ability to go one more step, when I didn't know where my next spiritual breath was going to come from, when my voice became no deeper than a whisper in the dust, as the scripture says, and I cried out to the Lord, those were the moments where I've found the greatest deliverance and the greatest strength, where I found God answering in prayer in a way I never thought he would, doing things I never, I never it didn't even come to my mind that he could answer prayers the way he has over the years. I thank God for that. I thank God for the cry that's coming into the hearts. People are tired of godlessness. They're tired of the breakdown of our families. They're tired of the destruction of everything good. They're tired of the endless bickering that calls itself government. They're tired of these things. They're tired and there's a cry coming in, especially the hearts of God's people. But I've also seen in this prayer meeting, and you've seen it too if you've been here, prayer requests coming up. My wife is a Christian, I'm not. Would you tell me how do I get to be a Christian? How can I walk with God? There's so many coming in now saying, oh, I'm drug addicted, I don't like this, I don't wanna be this way. I once knew Christ, I'm a total hypocrite, I've backslidden, I'm far away from God. I wanna get back to God, I hear a cry. And the evidence of that cry is most of these prayers are not anonymous, most of them have a name and a town. It's as if the person has finally come to the place of saying, I don't care who knows, I don't care who knows what I am. I'm tired of being this way. I'm tired of the powerlessness. I'm tired of godlessness being all around me. I'm tired of it having a control of my life and dictating my future. And when a prayer becomes a cry, God begins to hear. God came to Moses, not because the people of Israel had done anything right, but he said, I've heard their cry. I've heard them. Their prayer has turned into a cry. Their, their prayer, they've come to the point now of knowing there is no deliverance apart from my hand delivering them. And when you and I get to that point, the hand of God will move one more time. When we realize as the Israelites did in Gideon's time that we can't stop this horde of hell coming in and destroying everything that we try to put our hand to. We begin to realize and there's a cry coming into the heart of the people again. God says, I've I've determined in my heart to move when I hear that cry. The enemy will always overplay his hand. He will always go too far. He never knows when to stop. You always just take one step too far towards the people of God where finally God himself rises up and says, that's enough. These are my people. This is my testimony. This is my house. You have, you've gone too far in this thing. Now, how does God manifest his strength again. What will it look like in, in our generation? In chapter 28, where we started, in verse one, it says, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. The sun was rising on a brand new day of a brand new week. There was about to be a spiritual awakening, perhaps like none other, which had ever been recorded in history. A season where sorrow was about to be turned to joy, confusion was to give way to clear vision, and weakness was going to be turned into strength. Just as God had with Moses, he was about to send out two ordinary people to tell others what had been done and what God himself intended to do. Just two ladies, Mary Magdalene, and it says the other Mary, coming to the grave to mourn. And many people come to church like that on Sunday morning. If I'm hearing right, if I'm reading these prayer requests the way they're coming into this church, many of these people are attending churches, but to them, it's a grave. To them, it's a powerless Christ that is somehow sealed behind a stone. And they're coming there to mourn. They're mourning the loss of their families 
the loss of their strength, the loss of their freedom, the loss of their past, the loss of their future. And there's a mourning. They're either coming and sitting. It's as if in a graveyard, listening to sermons that don't touch them, that don't reach them. There's no power in them. Rhyming words, little sermonettes that people have gotten from the internet that don't minister life. And they're sitting there and they're grieving in their heart. But this one day of coming to this sepulcher, they encountered a messenger who told them that they were no longer to be afraid, that Jesus was alive, and they would soon speak face to face with him again. Oh, thank God. Folks, that's the way that the Lord is going to touch this generation. Messengers are going to rise up again, and starting in the pulpits, there's going to be men and women who say, enough of this powerlessness, enough of having churches on every corner, and we're not affecting our society. Enough of a church without prayer meetings, no compassion for the poor, no hunger for the word of God, enough. There are going to be men and women who finally rise up, beginning, I believe, in the pulpit of many churches and saying, I've, this has gone on long enough. And for those that are listening and will be listening online in the future, pastors, for the sake of God and for the sake of the testimony of Christ and the people that you and I minister to, that something's got to get inside your heart where you say enough of this, enough of dead looking people sitting before me in the house of God, enough of the powerlessness, enough of people addicted, enough of people afflicted in their minds, enough of the breakdown of our families and our homes and our marriages in the house of God, enough of the fornication that goes on in the house of God. You and I are going to rise up and begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ again. And when the messenger rose and the messenger spoke, the two ladies who had just come to a grave to weep. And the keepers began to tremble at the sight of the messenger, for they knew that they could not suppress what God had decided to do. When God decides to do something, nobody can stop it. No skeptic, no scoffer, no scorner. I don't care how deeply they become entrenched in society. I don't care how much they are just rubbing their hands saying, well, that's the end of that. We've crucified Christ. We're now in a post-Christian society. I want to tell you something, folks. As long as Jesus is alive, we are never in a post-Christian society. Oh, no, 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 no. We are going to hear the gospel preached again in our generation. We're going to get rid of all the fancy stuff that has come into the house of God and go back to preaching the cross of Jesus Christ, the full atonement of his blood, the penalty and power of sin being broken in people's lives, the new and resurrected life that God promises to those who will trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation. No, sir, we're going to go back and start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ again, the resurrected life of God through Jesus Christ. I predict that the keepers of this generation are going to shake. Those who thought they had the testimony of Christ sealed up in a tomb. Those who set a guard and said, no, sir, you can't pray here. You can't do this there. You can't do that there. When all of a sudden the stone rolls away one more time and God says, just in case you forgot, I am God and you are not. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The keepers of this generation will soon shake again, for Jesus is now starting to speak to those who belong to him. He's speaking about freedom. He's saying, I, the Spirit of God is upon me to preach the great tidings to those that are poor and know that they need something other than themselves. I've come to set free those that are captive, give sight to those who can't see their way out. I've come to heal those that have been bruised in heart. I've come to give you new life and give it to you more abundantly. I've come to give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. 
I've come to give you hind feet so you can climb the highest mountain. I've come to teach your hands to war so that a bow of steel will be broken by your hands. I've come to give you power to run through a troop and leap over a wall. I've come to you because you are my people. You are the testimony of the living God on the earth. The keepers of this generation will soon shake for Jesus is speaking now to his church. He's not speaking to us in our strength, but in our weakness. Thanks be to God, not in our eloquence of our prayers, but for the cry that has come into our hearts. I don't know about you, but I'm not satisfied to have the name of Jesus Christ trampled into the ground every moment of every day in this generation. I'm not satisfied to have our children lied to in our schools and told there is no God. I'm not satisfied to see a generation bowing down to this golden statue of the pride of man every time men play their tune, causing the society to bend down. I am not satisfied because Jesus Christ is still alive in this time that we're living in. He said to the prophet Ezekiel, to his Old Testament people Israel, I will not do this for your sake because you have profaned my name everywhere you've gone. In other words, the way you've traveled, the way you've intermingled in society. And when you were declared to be the people of God, the way you lived, the way you talked, the way you acted, your lack of fervency for the kingdom of God was a reproach to the name of God. I'm not going to do it because you've done anything right. He said, but I'm going to do it for my holy name's sake. I'm going to take you out of your places of captivity. I'm going to sprinkle clean water upon you. I'm going to give you a new heart, a new mind, and a new spirit. I'm going to raise you up, and your desolate places are going to be inhabited, and the barren places are going to become fruitful. I'm going to bring you together into cities and you're going to start to pray and you're going to ask me to increase these cities with flocks of men as Jerusalem and her Solomon holy feasts and I will do it for you as you begin to ask me to do what only God can do. He will also do it for the sake of those who have never heard and will turn to him if they're given the chance. In my heart, I've seen a day coming to New York City and I pray to God it sweeps the country when churches are full everywhere just for the fact that people are meeting with God and God is answering their prayer. Nobody needs to lead it. The Lord's going to meet with people all by himself. It's already starting to happen in New York State. Those that have been following the news, you'd be surprised that Catholic people are beginning to fill churches. They're using social media. They're texting and they're calling it mass mobs. So they call it in the media, mass mobs, because they're Catholic and they have a mass so they're calling in mass mobs where they go into these old stone churches, stand up room only, in one case, a week or two ago, just to pray. Now, I, they don't know fully how to pray the way we do, but I happen to believe that God's big enough when people begin to seek him, he will find a way, he will reveal himself to people when they begin to pray. Would be to God this would start happening with the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Church of Scotland, everybody in New York City begin to text and say, let's just get together and meet and pray. Let's just pray. Let's pray how we know how to pray. If you've got to open the, a book and read it, let's just pray. Let's start seeking God. Let's get back to what we once knew was right and what brought the blessing of the Lord into our homes and families in days gone by. The call to proclaim the victory of the cross is not going to be given to the strong, but to those of us who know that we need a savior. I thank God for this with all my heart. You look all through scripture, folks, it's not the strong. You'll never ever find some magnificent soldier parading in and getting the revelation and going out and gathering the people. It's always the Esthers, the Moses, the Gideons, the Davids in his youth. And it's the two Marys. Who did Jesus choose to speak to first? Who did he send the message to first? Two Marys, two ordinary women, two women who are so grateful for what had been done in their lives that they didn't care what the world said. They didn't care about the sneers and the scorns of, of going to visit what the world then would have considered a dead Christ. They didn't care. They found the reproach of Christ greater riches as Moses did than all the treasures of Egypt. They're not going to bow down under the snickers and threats of a generation that opposed their own salvation. 
but they were willing to be identified with Jesus Christ. And that's where it all starts, folks. That's where courage comes. That's where healing begins. When you and I are willing to be identified with Jesus Christ, though the world mocks him and scorns him and puts him on a billboard and declares him to be a myth and declares those who follow him to be of feeble mind and bigoted and everything else, that you and I are still willing in our heart to say, no, I would rather identify with him than with you, than this fallen world. I, I don't care where you've placed him. I don't care what kind of a seal you say you've put over the entrance that bars me access to him. I'm going to where he is. I would rather be identified with a dead Christ than with a living world. That's what these women were saying in their hearts. And when they got there, they were saw, they got to experience the beginning of the greatest awakening the world has ever known. This stone that separated them from Christ supernaturally moved away. A messenger standing there telling them they don't need to be afraid. Christ has risen. And you go tell others he's risen. He's going to meet with you. He's going to speak to you plainly face to face. And the scripture says they left that place of death with both fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. I've heard a word. That's all they could have said. I've heard a word and the word told me and it bore witness in my heart that Jesus Christ is alive. The world has tried to put him and seal him behind a stone, but he moved the stone one more time. The stone has moved out of the way. He is alive. He is coming to meet with us. He's coming to speak to us. And we know that's going to be power. That's going to be a testimony. That's going to be freedom. That's going to be a commission. That's going to be something of God's glory. The world cannot stop. It, the world doesn't know how to stop it. They cannot stop the God who created this world from doing what he determines in his heart to do. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We need to be willing to identify with him, to seek him and to love him, no matter where the world has placed him. No matter the scorning or the folding of the hands or the rage against Christ. And we're living in a generation now where the heathen are raging against our Christ. But you and I have to be willing because in reality, for those who can still hear it, we are still more and mightier than they are. And I thank God for that with all my heart. God will give you joy and freedom and victory and strength in a word, you'd be able to meet with him and leave the place where he is with such a reverence of who he is and such great joy. You'd be able to speak to other people and tell them, Jesus is not dead. He's very much alive. He speaks to me every day. I open his word, whispers to my heart on the subway. No matter where the society has tried to place him, he is still alive. I don't know what, what his plan is. They couldn't have known, but they knew he had a plan. Rome had legions of armies that had conquered most of the known world. There was a religious system in place that was allied with this political power and both of them together hated God and the things of God, of Christ. And it would have seemed a hopeless situation, but one more time, the plan of God, the wisdom of God is foolishness to men. And it's amazing. God says, now what do I need? What have I always needed throughout history? 120 people ought to do it. We we'll gather them in a little upper room. And I will let them be touched with the power of heaven. And that should be sufficient to bring down the Roman Empire. It should be sufficient to stand against all that hell in this world has thrown against Christ. Not in our strength, but in our weakness. Not in our eloquence, but in the cry of our hearts. Can you imagine the people in that upper room in Acts chapter 2? All of them had failed. They had all failed. They had run. They'd all kept their distance. There was nobody that 
really had the courage or strength to do what their own hearts had boasted they were capable of doing. What do you think their prayer sounded like in the upper room? I think I know. Oh God, if you don't come, this is gonna be suicide. If you don't touch us, we have no power. If, if you don't give us what we need, and their prayer became a cry. And one more time, he responded to that cry. I'm going to seek him no matter where this world places him. I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ, and neither should you be. Get your freedom now. There's freedom in Jesus Christ, but you have to want it. You have to get to a place where you really don't care what other people say. Get your freedom. There's freedom in Jesus Christ. Freedom from all of the captivity of this world, the fear of man, bondages of sin, the double-mindedness that brings weakness, spiritual weakness into your life. There's freedom from all of these things, but you need to get it now. And so that's my altar call this morning. It's very, very simple. I'm going where Jesus is. I'm not gonna be ashamed to walk with him. I'm gonna join those that are submitting prayer requests online and they're just, they're being vulnerable. They really don't care who knows. They just want the freedom that God has and God is answering them sovereignly. They're coming away from the prayer meeting knowing that Christ is alive. And so I'm not going to sit here in my stew. I'm not gonna sit in my bondage. I'm not gonna sit in my secret captivity any longer. I'm getting up and out of this place and I'm going with God. I'm going to be part of what the Lord's going to do in this generation. And let all of the keepers of my life begin to shake. That's gotta be the cry of your heart. Let everything of hell that, that's told me I'm gonna always be sealed up in this place that I'm never gonna know the freedom of God. I'm never gonna have a productive spiritual life. Let all these things begin to shake because I hear the voice of God calling me and I'm getting up and I'm going towards him and he's gonna be God to me. I'm gonna walk with him, he's gonna walk with me and my life is gonna count for something in this generation. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Tell you one thing, this isn't an eloquent message, but it's true. I hear something. I hear it in my heart. I hear it deep inside. We're living at an incredible moment in history, but you have to be free. And so this day, if you want the freedom that Jesus Christ offers you, and I tell you on the authority of his word, if you'll move towards him, he will set you free. I'm gonna open up the front of this auditorium and in the annex between the screens, the same in North Jersey. And for those who are at home, we must be a free people now. And if you want freedom in your life from whatever it is that's holding you back, I'm gonna ask you to step forward and then we're gonna to pray together and we're gonna to believe God for freedom this day in Jesus' name. Let's stand, please. If the Lord's speaking to you, just come. Join those that are making their way here. We'll pray together. Now, there's got to be a cry come into your heart. I can't pray this for you. But if, if you have a cry for freedom, he's gonna, he'll give you that freedom. You have to hate sin. You have to want to walk away from what is wrong and walk towards what is right. And it's... It's a good thing to say you're sorry for what you've done. You're the one that had to turn the device on. You're the one that let these images into your mind, for example, and, and that's how you're, you're afflicted. Now, Christ will set you free, but you have to hate it or you'll go back there again. Say, Lord, put a hatred in my heart for what is wrong and put a love in me for what is right. And that is no matter what it is that you're struggling with today. But the cry must be in your heart. The same cry we're hearing on this, this prayer call on Tuesday night. So people have just said, I don't care if the whole world knows. I'm done with this. And I want out. And when you go home tonight after praying, 
Read Psalm 107 and you'll find yourself in there and read what God will do when your prayer turns into a cry. When you've come to that place of desperation saying, Lord, I want to be free and I want to live for you and I want to count for good and I want to make a difference in my generation and I want to have the spiritual authority to pull my family out of the grip of hell and bring my children and grandchildren and cousins and nephews and nieces and brothers and sisters into a relationship with God. So Lord, deliver me from the mediocrity that has gotten a hold of my life and bring me into that which is real spiritual authority. I'm going to ask my wife Teresa to come and pray for you, for Pastor Teresa to pray. And as she does, I want you to lift your voice, everybody in the sanctuary, and let your prayer just for the next few minutes become a cry. Let it come from right inside your heart, whatever it is that you want God to do in your life. And you got to get to the point where you don't care what the person on your left or right thinks because they're in the same mess you're in, so it really doesn't matter. You just, you just lift your voice and begin to cry out to God as she leads us in prayer. Father, we come in the mighty name of Jesus. This name that is above every thing, everything. Lord, I just pray today. Help us, oh God. Help us, oh God. Lord, we pray, oh God, for that cry. I thank you, oh God, that you hear the prayers of an honest heart and you hear the cries. There is never one cry of our heart you do not hear. And Lord, we come now saying you are good and you are hearing us. And we pray, oh God, for a cry, oh God, to be able to turn away from things that need to be turned away from. We pray, oh God, for humility. We pray, oh God, for the ability to believe you. We pray, oh God, that we will be able to stand in an evil time. We pray, oh God, that you would keep us in the faith, that we would not le uh, lightly give up, oh God, what you have given us. We pray, oh God, for this grace, oh God, not to lightly give up what you have given us. I pray, oh God, that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit, that you would make us men and women, oh God, that are filled with your spirit and fearless in this age, that we could love like we should love, we could forgive like we need to forgive, we can turn the other cheek, oh God, but we can also stand in the day of battle. That Lord, I thank you, oh God, that this is not possible with men, but this is possible with you and only with you. So I thank you, Lord, for your mercy that never fails. I thank you for your grace that will be abundant. I thank you for loving us in a way we can't even begin to imagine. I thank you, you have chosen us and you have called us. And Lord, you will fill your church one more time. You will be faithful to yourself to raise up a testimony. But Lord, we know ourselves, we know our frame, we know our weakness. So we cry to you, O oh God, and we ask you to give us the grace, O oh God, to turn from what we need to turn from and to be asked to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we may do your will, that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I thank you, O oh God, that you understand the weakness of our humanity, but you've also chosen to fill us with your life and your spirit. And so God, you will be our quickening spirit, you will be our conscience. You will be our strength. You will be our holiness. You will be our goodness. You will be all that we need to if we but ask you. And I thank you. It only takes a tiny little faith, the grain of a mustard seed to pull down the glory of heaven into our soul. It takes only a tiny little bit of faith in a great big Jesus to move the darkness. And so we declare today the keepers of the tomb, the keepers of the chains, the keepers of uh, the darkness will shake again because there will be a people 
who say, my God loves me, he forgives me, and he is changing me. He will move me forward. My strength is of him, and the glory will go to him. So thank you, this age is not left orphaned. This age is not left without a witness. This age will not be left without the glory and love of Jesus Christ in his church. It begins today. Let it begin with me. Let it be the cry. Let it begin with me. As weak as I am, let it begin with me. That I may lift up my eyes that I will know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, and I shall not be defeated because he was not defeated. He will never be defeated. Oh God, thank you for filling us and changing us for your glory. We give you the praise. We give you the glory for what you are doing, what you are starting. Let it move in the power of the Spirit. We will be grateful. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for hearing us and answering us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.